Welcome to the Butterwick Hospice at Stockton. I reluctantly made my first film about the hospice movement about a quarter of a century ago. Why reluctant? Well, I didn't really want to cross the threshold. I thought, like many other people, that a hospice would be a dark, depressing place filled with grief or the fear of grief, somewhere people went to die. Well, I needn't have worried. My apprehensions were quickly dispelled. There are tears, worries and death, but there's happiness, love, care and support by the bucket load. For the next 30 minutes, why not join me behind the scenes of one of the North East's best loved charities. It'll make you laugh and it'll make you cry, because every moment really does count. Butterwick Hospice actually started here, 10 Hartburn Lane, Stockton, back in 1984. Yes, this unassuming semi was the first Butterwick Hospice. Mary Butterwick converted it into a day centre after her husband John died from a particularly aggressive form of cancer. Mary despaired at the lack of specialist care available to people going through such end-of-life pain and distress. She vowed that no one should have to die without dignity, and the Butterwick movement had begun. Mary was eventually awarded the OBE by Prince Charles. She died in the hospice in 2015, but her inspiration lives on today, as does the pride of daughter Julia and granddaughter Karen, today a hospice ambassador. I'm extremely proud of my mum and everything she's achieved, you know. She's helped so many families and so many people over the years and, you know, and it's fantastic people still, you know, think of the Butterwick and they think of Mary, you know. So, but as a family, we're all extremely proud of her. I'm so proud of what she's achieved. I mean, to be sat here in this room, but in the hospice, helping so many, well, hundreds, if not thousands of families every year. And it's not just the actual the building, it's like the nurses go out to see patients. It's just a massive organisation that helps people of Teesside and beyond. Her inspiration to start the hospice and to work really hard was the way that my father died um, he was left on his own in a room in the old Middlesbrough General Hospital. Nobody explained to her what was happening. We didn't realise how close he was to death. And, um, and she found that so difficult to, to deal with that she just wanted to do something, you know, to help other families and other people so that they weren't in that position that she, you know, we as a family and she'd been in. When I look back about what my nan has achieved, especially that she started nearly 40 years ago. I mean, even now today it would be extremely hard to set up a hospice, but 40 years ago she overcame lots of barriers, including her own grief. You know, my granddad had just died and she went out against all the odds and built a wonderful organisation, helping thousands of families. Medical people found it quite difficult, I think, at the time, because obviously, I mean, we're going back, what, you know, 30-something years ago, well, nearly 40 years ago, and, um, you know, and she was a housewife, and what did she know about, you know, this type of thing? But she was a very determined lady, and she knocked on a lot of doors and got a lot of doors shut in her face, but she kept on going. But, yeah, the medical profession, I think some of them found it quite difficult. I was only a baby when my granddad died, um, so a lot of my childhood, actually I didn't see, get to see my nan very much because she dedicated her life to the hospice. It was only really when I became an adult that we got to see each other more and go for afternoon teas and lunches together and do things together, but she dedicated a lot of time, effort. Obviously, she gave her house, I mean everything, she gave everything to it spiritually, everything. Yeah, it's strange sometimes that people, you know, would come up to, to my mum when she was still alive, you know, and always felt that she would remember them and know them. And, and, and towards the end it was quite difficult because when she was ill herself, um, she found it sometimes quite hard because a lot of people wanted a bit of her. Um, but yeah, it's strange because yes, everybody felt they knew her and they did but obviously not the same way that we kind of know her, knew her. Uh, but, but it just makes us very proud because whenever you, if you ever say to anybody, oh, you know, 
my mum was Mary Butterwick, they're just like, really? You know, that's just fantastic. You must be so proud of her. And yeah, we are. Mm. When, when I was asked to be ambassador, I didn't have to think twice. I was so proud to be asked, but I was a little bit nervous because I don't want people to think that I'm taking over her job and I will never be as amazing as my nan. Um, but what I do want to do is continue telling the story, promoting the hospice, making sure it, it moves you know, upwards and upwards. The hospice soon outgrew Hartburn Lane and moved here, nearby to a converted convent in Bishop Road West. The reputation for excellence and compassion began to grow, as did the demand for beds and daycare. The first place she did was at Hartburn Lane, was just a day centre. Um, it was somewhere where people could go and be with other people who had cancer or, you know, that whatever illness was wrong with them. And, and just to be, you know, supported. Uh, and she used to be hairdressers and, and they would do a different therapy. And it would also perhaps give the families a, a bit of a rest on those days because, you know, the patient could come, spend the day there, they'd have something nice to eat and company. And then from there, she realised that there was a, a need for somewhere for people to, to stay. And that's when they then moved up to Bishopton Road when they bought the, the convent, the old convent, and then became a, a bedded unit. Today there's a purpose-built hospice next to North Tees University Hospital. It's impressive, but so are the running costs. £10,000 each day, 365 days a year. That's £4 million annually, and only a quarter of this is paid by the NHS. The rest comes from relentless fundraising and public generosity. There's a small army of volunteers who give their time at the drop of a hat. Without fundraisers and volunteers, we wouldn't exist as an organisation. A massive amount of our services are provided and supported by volunteers. We have over just under 600 volunteers with just three times more than we have staff so that gives you an idea of, of the level of support we have. We couldn't afford the wage bill if we had to pay these volunteers but it's not just the the fact that they're volunteers it's the dedication it's the fact that they care that they want to give up their own time which is something you can't well you can't buy in people you know it's 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 a it's a trait in people that is commendable and we just couldn't survive without that. I'm a volunteer at the Butterwick because I previously was a medical receptionist and when I retired I wanted to do something else so I went to be a receptionist at the hospice voluntarily. Subsequently, 15 years later, I'm still there but I am now working on the family support team. Please bear in mind the good it does it looks after the terminally ill, it looks after the families of the terminally ill, it feeds them with the catering. It, they, there's a daycare unit that looks after them five days a week. There's a family support team to look after their emotional needs. It's a place for the living. People think of the hospice as a place for the dying, and yes, people do die there, but people are given a life before they die there. Butterwick, here at Stockton and at Bishop Auckland, offers therapy, a community hub, counselling and respite care. There's a hospice too for children and for teenagers and young adults. Stockton has an inpatient unit for those precious final days. The hospice cares for all ages and it doesn't charge patients a penny. We don't just care for patients, we care for relatives and family of, of the patients in here. And we are a, a support mechanism and we're like a big family. We're part of the community in that we've touched most people's lives, we've touched a lot of families' lives and that makes us a big, big part of the local community. Without the hospice, the community would have nothing. There would be no care and support for people who were going through very traumatic times in their lives. We would be where we were 30 years ago. The hospice movement is only a very recent movement in health terms and prior to that people were just left alone to cope on their own. The community isn't on its own anymore. 
We have support workers, we have nursing staff, we have volunteers that are there to make the community feel that they are supported and make families of, of patients in hospice know that they have someone to turn to, someone that's there to listen to them, someone that's there whose shoulder they can cry on and someone who's there that understands what they're going through and that means an awful lot to families who are, are suffering loss or or even just don't understand what's happening to the, the, the family and their loved ones it would be it would be a very sad place to be without Butterwick. It costs four million pounds a year to provide end-of-life care and some of it comes from the most unlikely sources. The biggest is Ladies' Day at Hardwick Hall. 1,300 ladies done up to the nines enjoy shopping, a meal, Prosecco, top-class entertainment, butlers and, did we mention Prosecco? It's followed up with a weekend in Blackpool hosted by drag queens, six double-decker buses, party games, bingo and a pub crawl. It's all great fun and raises awareness and much-needed funds. On a more formal note, Butterwick relies heavily on the support of the business community. Al Cooling and Patricia Boynton help bring in thousands of pounds each year by persuading businesses to become corporate supporters and perhaps donate up to £5,000 each. The corporate sector on Teesside um, support the Butterwick Hospice magnificently. We've worked hard over the last 10 years to recruit as many companies as we can. We recruit the larger companies as big as PD Ports, right down to the one-man um, organisations. Butterwick provide networking events. These events provide an opportunity for companies to meet their friends, acquaintances, but most importantly to meet new companies. We are told over and over that um, new business relationships are made at our corporate events. Uh, we try to keep our guests direct level and above to make it as interesting as possible for the decision makers that make up our corporate plans. Butterwick Hospice would suffer without corporate support. Corporate support has become incredibly um, essential in providing the hospice with the funds that they need to continue to care for people with end of life illnesses. Without corporate support, who knows? I can't really say. Anne and Patricia are passionate about their work, but Patricia has extra motivation to help the hospice succeed on the fundraising front. Her partner, Andy, battled pancreatic cancer for years before he was admitted and died in early 2017. I, I thought it was a great place to work. It's not until you've experienced it firsthand you really do appreciate what a wonderful place it is. And the service it gives to the patients and the families is just incredible. I was thinking three to six months, we'll just make them most of the next three months. But luckily it lasted two and a half years, which was really incredible. So we always knew from day one, it was never gonna be for the long term. And we just thought, well, we'll just make the most of the time we've got. And that's exactly what we did. The day that he went into um, Butterwick, Hospice was the day before Mary Butterwick's funeral. I can remember he was sat in the room by the, the French doors and he just said, thank you. And I th think that's how I would, I would describe Butterwick, thank you. Because just peace just descended upon not only Andy and his parents and the extended family, but his friends and everyone because they knew he was cared for then. Because in the hospital, it's just so chaotic. And in the hospice, it's so one-to-one -one personal care. And it's just peaceful. And if you've got any problem, any concern, you just have to put your head out of the door and say, can I have a word? And there's someone there. And that's the difference. Millie was just by his side the whole time. Um, used to sleep at the end of the bed, was always on his knee and 
Millie was in the hospice every day. They'd walk Millie. If, you, if we wanted to walk in, they'd arrange someone to walk Millie. The nurse even provided the dog bowl for the water. That's how, how personal the attention is you get at the hospice. I've met many remarkable people over the years at the Butterwick Hospice, including an old friend of mine, John Sands, a mover and shaker in the brewing industry. When I heard he was here, I thought I'd visit him and find him sitting in an office wearing his pinstripe suit and giving out pearls of business wisdom to the people who run the hospice. But John was a patient. I'll close by letting him tell his own story. I've got um, what you would call a metastasizing bladder cancer which means it's a very fast growing cancer. Um, it's now spread into my spine and <clears throat> other parts of my body, part of my lung, which means finally it will, it will be terminal. I entered the hospice with trepidation. Um, images of hospices were always, well, this is the end, you know, this is the place where you go to die absolutely completely wrong it's a place where you go to learn to live again and enjoy the rest of your life and it has been an absolute burden it has been an absolute burden on my family being ill but going into the hospital has removed that burden give them a plan understand where i'm going and brought me out and i'm actually it's very odd i know i am terminally ill but i don't feel terminally ill now i feel as though i've got life and that's the sound of the hospice. And the hospice is an incredible place. Two things, one to manage the pain, because you get incredible pain with cancer if it's not managed, and they have done a superb job with that. The other is, it's the way they've tackled all the issues that make you whole. You go to the hospital, you're in your urologist department, you're in your oncologist department, and you're moving around. <coughs> With the hospice, they look at you as an entirety and actually treat you as a whole person. And that is incredible in a sense when you deal with the medical profession. They're so happy, they're so good, they're so friendly. Um, the only thing I would say is that uh, if you were making people well and <laughs> recover, it would be even better, but their role is to actually manage you through this process. Surprise me um, how caring it is, how um, how they've actually gone that extra mile. They'll go that extra mile. They'll 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 find ways of making you feel more comfortable. And it's about comfort, and it is about um, making sure that you don't have an enormous amount of pain. I've had an extension of my life where I've been able to share with my family, I've been able to share with my friends, I've been able to talk to you about it, um, to be able to be with loved ones and feel as though I've been able to talk through the love that I needed to talk to. And it has extended my life. Four days, four weeks ago, I thought I was going to die. I was in Butterwick, it was an absolute pain. And then within three days, they had turned me around. And that, that four weeks I had, I spent with my family, I spent with my grandchildren, I bought them all lockets so I could do things for them. And it was fabulous.